Good morning, everyone. I'm going to get started dead on 11. So we've got a, oop, there we go. <laughs> because it's going to be another one of those classes with so much to cover. So before I, I get started, I just wanted to, um, you know, talk a little bit about what we're going to be uh, doing as we go um, forward from here, from this class onwards. And one of the first things I wanted to mention was that um, you know, if you're if you're working to try to improve your drawing, you may not really know where you're going with that. Like, what's the end result that you're after? You just know that you want to improve and that you want to um, to practice and and you want your drawing to look better than the drawing that you did before. And sometimes we don't really know what that means, what what that better is. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today while we're working on uh, on drawing. Um, one thing I just would like to say to, to start off with is if you are drawing things right now from this class that are recognizable, <laughs> that you actually were able to make it look, you know, somewhat like whatever the subject was that we're drawing, then I want you to consider that a success already. Because representational art in particular doesn't necessarily mean photographic of, you know, photorealistic, anything like that. Um, if we look at the sketches that have been done by artists who are hanging in the major museums, for example, often their sketches and our sketches look exactly alike. And it's difficult to remember that. So as we go through uh, the class today, I just want you to remember that, that you already have achieved a great degree of success. Where you go from here will um, depend a lot on, you know, how much you draw, uh, you know, how much you think about what you're drawing while you do it. But uh, we've already managed to get quite a quite a ways just by drawing all these different subject matters. And today, what we're going to be drawing is uh, three figures in a group. And now, of course, everybody breaks out in a sweat when I start to talk about <laughs> figures. But what we're talking about today is drawing a group, not drawing three individual people. Um, in fact, we're going to stay away from details because it is this idea of the composition and the group that's more important. So let me go ahead and get started. Okay, folks, welcome back to another summer of drawing. And this is, I can't believe it, but this is class number 11. <laughs> We're on the theme of home. And I decided I would, uh, you know, use a turn of phrase, home is where the art is. And let me show you why. So over the years, uh, I've had a number of different studios. The one in the upper left is where I am now. Um, on the upper right was a, uh, in a flour mill. Um, in St. Michael's, Maryland. Um, I had a room in there that I used. Uh, in the lower left is um, a corner of a converted tool shed, which Bill and I lived in when we first moved to Martha's Vineyard. The entire square footage was about 14 by 21. So I carved out a little space in the corner. Then there have been other studios, like the, the one in the lower right, where I had to actually uh, change the color <laughs> quite drastically to, to white or something neutral in order to be able to work. I've had to dig out, um, I've had a, a studio that I actually had to dig out about six inches of bird manure to clean out the entire place. So uh, the various places that I have used, um, you know, which are sort of my home for doing art have been quite varied. Um, I had a place down when I was doing graphic design at Five Corners in, in Vineyard Haven, and that's the interior in the middle. And then when we went to uh, uh, Nashawina, I worked up above a workshop in, in a very small and rather dimly lit space. And that's where I learned uh, to paint. That's when I, where I started oil painting. But my real feeling is that wherever I've got a sketchbook in hand, and here's me at Polly Hill in March of this year, bundled up a drawing, <laughs> that that is where... That, that's home to me, uh, as long as I have a sketchbook and a, and a pencil in hand. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way as well, that you can be comfortable in, you know, in a, on a plane, in a train, on a car, in a car, uh, as long as you have that sketchbook there. And so I thought I would um, do something this week that allowed us to draw a group of people, but also sort of concentrated on that idea of art community. So here we have these uh, three women together. And my feeling is that Oh, the uh, the summer of drawing and the another summer of drawing community. Uh, you know, we're that it, it is home. You know, to to come online and to be amongst people who enjoy the same sorts of things that we are doing, who are trying for the same sorts of things. That's a home in and of itself. And so I liked this picture of these three women because to begin with, there's a lot of complexity that we have have to edit out in order to have this be a successful drawing today. Um, 
also, I liked this business of, of the figures leaning into each other, all of this dark that we have to deal with. Um, so all of this will be a little bit uh, challenging. However, if, if your brain right now is just freezing up <laughs> because of looking at three figures, looking at the trellis or the wrought iron in the background, wondering how you're going to do it. I want to concentrate on the idea of the group and not individuals. This is not figure drawing today. Uh, and, and we're not drawing wrought iron today. Um, what we're going to do is try to make a cohesive scene in the time that we have available, because this is a way to get started on drawings of this sort. Even if you have five hours and you can draw all the details, we don't. And so how, how do you start then? So let's talk about what needs to be in the scene, as we often do. So the three women, obviously, the sketching materials, because that's important to the story. Uh, the bench or some seating. It doesn't even have to look like this bench. The background wrought iron, I'm not sure. Um, I, when I started my sketch, I, I thought, well, maybe I'd add it in at the last minute. In the end, I decided not to, because it sort of took away from what I was after, which was these three women looking at the central central woman's um, sketch. So I think it's also very um, important to talk about, you know, when we when we think about drawing figures, we do tend to go, well, how am I going to draw that person? And how am I going to draw that person's face and that person's hands and feet? And today, I want you to forget about facial features, uh, drawing fingers and drawing feet. <laughs> We're going to put some shapes in, but um, but they can be very uh vague because the idea is of the group and when we when we talk about people in more than one we say a couple we'll say a group we'll say a mass of humanity um we'll say a crowd of people and it's that entity that you're trying to draw you're not if you're trying to draw a crowd of people you're not going to draw 50 individual people you're going to try to emulate what that mass of individuals looks like. And some of them may be more defined than others, but in general, you are not going to be trying to draw 50 different people. And the same goes for even three people. We're not really worrying about how do these people look. We are going to be worrying about the scene and the story and these two women leaning around the side to look at the other woman's drawing which we don't do here on another summer of drawing. We don't see each other's art, which I th thought was even funnier when I saw this picture. OK, so a word that you hear often when it comes to drawing people is the gesture, the gesture of the scene. Now, gesture, we tend to think if I go by like this with my hand, that's a gesture. Uh, but the gesture of a scene is is the movement, the action, um, how the bodies are leaning, you know, what's exactly going on here. So. The center woman sketches the focus. One woman is leaning back. Her arm is sort of raised in contemplation up, up near her mouth. The other two are angled inwards to see her drawing. That's the gesture, one going back and two coming in. And that's what we're going to try to get. Now, other things about the scene help echo that if you're trying to make a, a, a more detailed drawing. The, the positioning of the legs, for example, the sketch pads are very useful to sort of add to that feeling. Um, but it's this sense of, of unity around what is on the other side of that paper that we can't see. That is what sort of the focus or the story of this particular um, uh, composition is, rather than three individual figure drawings. So the angles that create that feeling are really important. And I think what happens often when somebody sees a scene like this or wants to start drawing people, they start, they start up there with the face and it all kind of falls apart from there because those details are hard to get, especially in miniature, especially then trying to add in all the proportions of everybody else. So what I want us to start on is this idea of the angles that create the feeling of the group, angles of the upper bodies, the arms, the sketch pads, and the legs. All of those kind of contribute to this sort of, uh, I don't even know what you would call it, um, but this sort of inward, inward facing um, design. So th the other thing in terms of observation is the lights and darks that create the feeling of the group. Now, normally I make you go through a note 10, and we're going to do that today as well, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up as to what the lights and darks look like, because it's difficult when we see something this um, complex to necessarily, even when we squint, to squint enough 
that we're really only seeing those lights and darks. So here on the lower right, what I do is I took this photo and I made it much darker and put it in black and white so you can really see. And what you notice here is that the black sort of surrounds these figures and that there's an interweaving of those darks between the figures, the legs underneath the bench, around the back, and that the lighter areas are really the central part of the story. Now, every now and again, you need a little bit of light here and there. For example, if you were going to do the feet or the side of the bench and this, that, and the other. But really, you've got a situation which is a little different from what we've been drawing up until now. We've been drawing a lot of things that are dark on light backgrounds, and this sort of goes the other way around. So one of the things I want to show you, I've got a little video here, and I'm just going to play it. And this is about when you're drawing, and this is sort of a sped up little sketch I did on the computer. When you're drawing, one way to sort of deal with these darks is to add them in as you go along. In other words, you don't have to draw an outline and then come back and fill it in like a coloring book. Sometimes when you're working through a drawing, particularly when you're doing it for the very first time, and this was just something I was sketching out of my head. Um, uh, so so <laughs> who knows what the coffee cup really looks like. But when you're doing it, you're sort of feeling your way around a scene. You're, you're feeling your way around and saying, is, is there a dark there? Is it darker than this area? Do I have to lighten something up? Do I have to make something darker? Uh, you know, what exactly is going on? And as you know, from the previous classes, the more you start to look at something, the more you can see in terms of detail, but that also means the more decisions you have to make. Should that thing go in? Should it not go in? So when we're looking at a drawing such as the one that we have today, it would be very possible to put a lot of stuff in, draw like very three very careful figures, and then start trying to figure out where the darks is. What I would like you to do instead is to try to work on those values as you go. So line work and, and filling in, massing in the values, however you want to do it, hatching like this or, or however you want to do it, um, that it, it's sort of done together so that it becomes a cohesive whole as you draw. I think that that will get some of the folks who are having a little bit of trouble getting away from too much outlining. It'll help you if you're working in the darks and the other values as you go. Now, there's still a good deal of line work, but there's also a good deal of value uh, demonstrated. So that was just a that was just a one minute thing. But um, Whoops, let's make it stop. Okay, now we're going to go for a little art history before we get started on the drawing. I wanted to show you this um, probably very well known to you painting by Edward Hopper called Nighthawks, which he painted in 1942. It's quite big, 33 by 60 um, inches. Um, and it has a good deal of, of detail in some places and much less in, in the others. There are lots and lots of lost edges and places where, for example, the back of that one fellow on the left-hand side just disappears into the background. Um, you know, the other other guy who's sitting over there by the woman, his, his far arm just disappears into the background as well. So this is a really effective painting in terms of lights and darks. I think, I think someone needs to mute themselves. I've got a little feedback going on here. Um, so if you squint at this, you can see some really defined uh, light areas, medium value, and lots and lots of darks. And I wanted to show you something cool, which I discovered recently, which it, this, these are some of the preliminary sketches Edward Hopper made for this drawing. Now, it, what's interesting to me, he didn't just sort of start one sketch and then add on to it until he got to the final result. He did a number of different drawings, number of different sketches, first sort of establishing the overall gesture of the scene, the feeling of the scene, and then what what those buildings might look like, what the people might be doing with it within those buildings. And then after he got to that point, um, or along with it, he started doing these sketches, sketches of people. And this is something I want you to keep in mind today, because this is the kind of approach we're going to be taking, where he's looking for you know, what does it look like when someone sits hunched over on a, at a, on a countertop? You know, what do they look like from the back? What do they look like from the front? Uh, what are the different objects in this particular case that he might want to have um, added to the painting? And also notice that the line work and the filling in, the line work and the shading are happening at the same time. He, he's not necessarily doing an outline and then filling it in. They're sort of going along together. Here are a couple of... Uh, 
ideas where he, he sort of fleshed it out a bit more, um, did a little bit in charcoal. Uh, you know, this might have been done later or in a time when he had a little bit more, you know, he could, could put a bit more thought into it because he's obviously developed the shading and the lighting and stuff more than he did in the previous sketches. And you can see his little sketches for the, uh, the coffee urns in the background um, are done as well. This kind of impromptu sort of sketching is so valuable to you because it adds into your memory bank all of this information. You know, how does somebody look when they're hunched over at the back? How, how do those sh shadows work? Without getting really tied into, um, you know, quote unquote, figure drawing. So as he got closer to deciding what he was going to do, you know, he was working out sketches for what he wanted the woman in the scene to look like, what, what she might be doing with her hands, how the shading fell. But this is not refined, you know, what we would think of as, you know, Michelangelo type of or, or Durer type of, of sketching. This is this is observation and trying to get that gesture. You know, the woman is leaning a little bit, um, you know, her hand is up. What does that look like? What does that make the other hand do? And then he did a couple more sketches where he started to figure out how the people were going to work, you know, who was going to be where, how many, what, what was going to be happening. Finally, he ends up with this sketch on tone paper, uh, which we love, <laughs> uh, where he's used light charcoal and dark charcoal and probably some pencil under there as well to really get the feeling of the scene. And then down on the lower left is, is what he ended up with for the painting, which has a few things a little bit different. He raised the um, the head of the fellow behind the counter. Um, he turned uh, the guy whose back is towards us a little bit more to the side. But it's so interesting to me to see this iteration and also to see that details don't have to go into those faces and those bodies. It's about the gesture of the scene. It's about you know how they're sitting and whether that conveys a sense of realism overall. And just for the heck of it, I threw in these last, you might know some of the paintings that go along with these sketches, but obviously sketching and drawing and getting a scene laid out and worrying about the lights and darks in particular was really important to Edward Hopper. Um, it, for all of these particular drawings, when you um, go and look at the actual paintings that go along with these, you'll really see that um, in terms of the values he used, regardless of the color, he has that same sort of balance and contrast. So this is what I'd like to keep in mind uh, as we go forth today. So the very first exercise we're going to do is we're going to create a small sketch, just like the one I've got down on the right. Um, this is not the actual drawing, so you can do it on whatever paper you want to. But I want to start off with just looking at the angles and drawing really roughly the, the main shapes of the people. So I'll give you a few minutes to work on this. What I don't want you to do, and just you can promise me <laughs> in your Zoom windows, that no drawing of facial features, no drawing of hands, no drawing of feet. Um, what we want, what we're after is, is a unified scene where the darks and lights are sort of bringing all of this together. Now, we are still going to do a no tan, but I wanted to start off just by giving you a few moments to, to absorb how this scene is working. And I've got that little image down there kind of showing you the angles if you're, if you're not quite sure. But even if you drew the most awful people ever, <laughs> if you got that feeling of the, of the folks leaning in and looking at that central figure's um, paper, it would give the idea of what's going on in the scene. And this is what I mean about, um, you know, how good does your drawing have to be? Like in terms of is good, uh, you know, hyper-realistic. And my feeling is that, a good drawing conveys whatever it is that you wanted to convey. And if you, if this is as far as you got and all you did was show these three people in a group, that still works. It works in and of itself because the gesture of the scene is properly conveyed. And the idea of what the focal point of the scene is, is conveyed, which is this thing that we can't actually see. So while you're working on that for a few minutes, I had some notes I wanted to go over. Because I know that this is sort of, okay, where do I even start with this thing? Notice on this particular sketch also that I haven't even included anything about, uh, you know, that wrought iron work in the background. We're just talking about the group, the cohesive group.
All right. So while you're sketching on that, I just wanted to talk a, a little bit more about this whole idea about improving or getting better. You know, it, it really comes down to at what are you trying to improve? You know, do you want your technical skill to be better? In that case, that's just a matter of, of practice, of, of doing a lot of drawing. Um, if, is it a matter of being able to observe uh, more closely? That also uh, is a matter of, of doing a lot of drawing and thinking as you go, you know, where, where are you trying to get to with this? Not just sort of starting to draw with no kind of direction, but having an idea where you'd like to land. I'm hoping that some of the classes that we've done this, this summer will give you an idea saying, hey, I'd like to do a drawing and I'd like it to be no more detailed than the, uh, the group sketch or, uh, you know, I'd like it to be to have little background like the houseboat we did up at the front, give you some sort of, of way to decide where you're going to go. But I also think that uh, practice, when people th say practice, you know, it tends to bring up in, in one's mind the idea of repetition and boredom, <laughs> maybe like practicing your scales on the piano or something of that nature. And what I just want to remind everyone is that every time you draw, you're practicing every single time, even if you're doodling, you're practicing. Um, and it's very important to think that way. Practice doesn't have to mean always at the beginning and never getting anywhere, because I think that's what stops people from doing it, stops people from drawing and practicing because they feel like, oh, this is just me and a hamster wheel and I'm not actually going to improve. Um, and so I'd like to remind you about doctors, dentists, and lawyers. So we talk about a, you know, a lawyer having a practice, you know, uh, a, a doctor's practice, et cetera, et cetera, dent dental practice. We don't actually expect those people are only at the very beginning and just repeating those very basic first steps. We're expecting that they have accumulated some knowledge, that they're not unskilled, um, and that by doing something over and over, that they're improving in various iterations um, and they're honing their skills. And I think that that is so important when we're thinking of practice. Um, it, is, it is a forward movement. Yes, there may be some cyclical repetition to it, but it is a, it is a rolling wheel. It is not a static log. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next thing. All right, so time for the no tan. This is more familiar ground, but it should be easier for you to do this. We'll just, just take a few minutes to, to work up um, a no tan. Uh, you know, small, keep it small, like one inch by two inch, no bigger than that. All you're doing is showing the dark and light patterns. Um, and in this particular case, I think I have included that little black and white uh, image for you to look at, because even though your no tan is going to be rough, it's not going to be like the little drawing that you just did. Um, the idea is that you're going to show that light and dark pattern, but you also need to identify where are you going to need some lights. And for example, when I did my little no tan, I was like, okay, well, I think I might even make the, the sketch pad the woman is holding up a little bit lighter. I think I am also going to include the sort of a light rim of light from that low stone wall that you can just see under the bench. I think that needs to be in there. Otherwise I'll have this big black background. So those are the sorts of things that at the no tan stage, you don't actually have to draw it out specifically. You don't have to be all that, that detailed about it, but it is really good to sort of figure it out. I also decided I needed to deal with what was, what was gonna happen with that wrought iron. Um, I knew that I probably wouldn't make the decision about whether it went in or not until the very end. Now. I will say if I was going to draw this up as a big drawing that I spent a few hours on, I might find a way to do a modulated background that included that wrought iron. But right now, I can see very clearly that there's a, a very good chance that it will compete with the people, that the design work itself is so large and heavy and dark. How do I make it? How do I make everything in the foreground even darker? So from a stylistic point of view, when you're drawing, you can just treat that as a as a in a lighter tone, lighter values, and and still have all of your other figures at the front. And if if that whole design work was important to you for for a larger drawing, and it, there are reasons it could be, it, it is quite interesting to look at. Um, that would be kind of a way to handle it. But for this drawing, for this situation, I decided hmm, there's a good chance that this is going to be too much. So why don't we 
put in a little dark and light in the background in such a way that it emphasizes what's going on. And my feeling was that the woman who is turned, the woman on the right who's turned in inwards and kind of craning her neck over to see what's going on, that giving her a little bit of emphasis and sort of, you know, even in the photo that it's a little bit lighter behind her, you know, just sort of exaggerating that a bit might end up being useful to the composition. So the Notan is the place to sort of play around with that, see if that stuff is going to work, um, but to keep it, you know, keep it really quick. Um, you know, it, it's, it will be easy as you go along to sort of make some of these decisions. This is just a starting point. All right, we're going to roll into the first bit of this. Okay, in order to give you guys a reasonable amount of time for each step, because this is a little bit complicated, especially this first one, um, we're just going to get started with, uh, I, I think we'll have a mm, probably about uh, seven or eight minutes at each, at each stage, and I'll sort of lead you through um, what I did. So I started off, using a very light pencil, I think I used an H, and carefully sketched out, kind of like we did in that, that initial uh, exercise, just sort of sketched out the main lines. And as you can see, I didn't do any cleanup or anything like that. I'm just trying to get the basics down. Um, I started sort of with a focal point, and then my my woman on the left ended up moving in a little bit closer than she is in the photo, uh, and I wasn't quite sure exactly how everything was going to work out, but I didn't really have to worry about it so much at this very first step. So right now, all you're doing is you're trying to place the objects, basically the people, and figure out what the central focus of the scene is. And so for me, it was making sure that all of those angles that I had in my little sketch to start off with, that I had those in the right place. And so there was a lot of double checking by holding up my um, pencil. One thing I, I discovered actually later on in the drawing that I hadn't actually got that piece of paper the woman is holding up right. I had to fix that later on. And so things like that, you know, you won't get it all right in the first stages, and I don't want you to worry about it. But the idea is that gesture, that sort of direction of what you're trying to show, the feeling of the overall group, that that is emphasized way before you start worrying about uh, anything to do with the details, anything to do with the specific features. So while you're working on that, I've got some more stuff to read to you. All right, so as I, as I was saying, you know, practice really has to do with, with just actually drawing. And so that's what you are all doing this summer by, uh, by participating in this and by drawing all the time. And I hope as time goes on that you'll just continue to find subject to, uh, to draw. Um, but most importantly that you start to, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but consciously think your way through a drawing, consciously go, okay, you know, I remember Elizabeth said, don't just race in and start drawing. <laughs> don't start drawing little eyes. <laughs> but actually look at the scene as a whole and go, what am I drawing? In this particular case, it's not three individuals, it's a group. And, and taking that and going, okay, I'm not drawing three individuals. I don't have to worry about every little anatomic, anatomical detail at this point. I just have to worry about that scene overall. This is going to make your drawings so much better and also it'll make it easier for you because then you can decide like you can literally decide hey i only want it to be two people or hey i like it being three people and i'm going to take that trellis off you're not being driven by the photo reference or even the scene in front of you that's so important so how will you know it's working how will you know your practice is actually working so if you're as i said if your goal is to produce recognizable drawings and you are already doing that, you know, you can, people can tell what it is that you drew, then you already have achieved that goal. And from now, it's just, um, now on, it's just a matter of refinement in whichever direction that you want to go to. Now, of course, if you are having trouble, you know, even getting to the point where things are recognizable, it's time to just pull back a little bit and concentrate on, you know, the angles, the proportions, the values, and that sort of thing. And if, if, your objects that, are tr you're, that you're trying to make recognizable are close, but not quite. Those are the same things that you look at to assess you know, where you're going wrong. Um, is it uh, a matter of the, the angles not being quite right? Is it a matter of, 
of things being dark when they should be lighter, uh, that sort of thing. But I do want to stress that in terms of, you know, is the drawing right or wrong, that is only uh, in your own mind. <laughs> there is so much art. I mean, we saw from Edward Hopper, I mean, people revere those sketches that had to do with that painting, uh, Nighthawk. But when you look at them, they're really no more developed than anything that we have done through another summer of drawing. But the idea is he, he was thinking his way through a process. He was willing to do drawing after drawing after drawing while he noodled around and tried to figure out where he was going. Uh, and it's this business of the iterative process, as we talked about before, you know, auditioning ideas, uh, doing rough sketches, doing little layouts like this. I'm going to just advance the slides one to show you. So what I did after I got the, those first uh, main angles is I went back then another time. Now, this is much darker on the screen than it was on my pencil, but I want you to be able to see it. I was working quite light. So now I switched to something like, a, I, I'm, it might have been um, like an HB uh, pencil at this particular point, to start identifying those lines that I could see pretty clearly that I thought were going to be important. The most, the most obvious uh, lines um, to do with the, the profiles of the people. And once again, building on those angles I had um, below. Now, because I was working quite light, and the paper, the pencil value is quite light as well. Then I just drew right over the top of what was already there because I knew that one of two things could be done afterwards. I could either go back and pick out all the stuff that I didn't need, or what I often do is I take my kneaded rubber eraser and kind of pat it over the drawing to lift up the extra graphite. So I've just got kind of a tracing left of what I had done, um, and and then refine it from that point. So there are lots of ways you can go about it. You don't have to leave all of these initial um, lines in place like this, but I just wanted to show this is sort of how I got to that next step. It's, uh, I think I do much more of my cleanup later in the drawing than I do to begin with, because you never know when those initial lines show activity and energy and such, and you don't really want to take, you don't want to sort of suck all of that life out of a drawing um, you know, unnecessarily. Okay, I am going to move us on to the next stage because I want you to have enough time to do all of this. So at this point, now we're, we're at the part that you're far more familiar with, which is sketching in the scene using line and mass at the same time as you draw. So this is sort of like what, you know, what Edward Hopper was doing, what, uh, what I was doing in that little sketch with a coffee cup, where you're, where you're drawing and shading and doing line all at the same time. I'm suggesting this and sort of emphasizing it for those folks who are having a hard time kind of figuring out where do you work the darks in? You know, do you do outline, you know, outline everything and then fill in the darks? And I'd like to suggest that you build in the darks as you go. So in this particular case, I had just erased a bunch of the line work that I thought was in the way and started drawing right over the top of my other stuff, but adding in, you know, making certain things darker, uh, you know, refining the lines in some places. I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen with the background, so I did a bunch of different texture stuff. And in this particular case, I am using my beveled pencil lead. And I think I started with a 2B and then went to a 4B because I really wanted to get some graphite down quickly. And I also wanted to get that feeling of unity amongst the darks uh, by using, I was drawing quite small. This is probably a six by seven drawing, something like that. By drawing small, uh, by using the, the big lead, the thick lead and the dark lead, um, I had to, I couldn't mess around with the details, which is what I would naturally be drawn to. Um, I would naturally be going, hey, I want to fill in little faces, you know, but this by using those larger tools, I, I can't. I have to concentrate on that feeling of the scene overall. And so um, don't forget that the eraser is your friend. Use it as a drawing um, tool as you go if you need to. Um, and also, if you're not pressing super hard on the paper, just being firm, you can still go back and erase quite a bit. <coughs> Unlike charcoal, um, you can pick up graphite as long as you really haven't mashed it into the page there. So every decision doesn't have to be carved in stone. You can go, well, I think this is where the legs go. I think this is where the feet go. 
Now, notice that I am not really including the feet. I mean, I'm trying to get the legs at the right angle because they'll imply feet. Um, I'm trying to get the arms at the right angle because they'll imply hands. And eventually I do define the hands a little bit more. But what I'm really after is the feeling of the people um, and, and how they're sort of leaning in and how the darks of the scene kind of encapsulate them, sort of, sort of enclose them uh, in this little vignette. Um, in that way, it doesn't become a picture of a corner that has a bench and wrought iron and three people. It is all about the three people, all about the group. And this is where you think about your editing as you're drawing going, if I add that in, is that is it necessary? Does it tell does it help the story? Um, do I just like it because it'd be something interesting to add? Um, and if I do add it, will it detract from, from what my focal point actually is? Now, for some people, the focal point might be the paper uh, itself that everyone is looking at. For other people, the focal point is the entire scene. So there is no right or wrong answer on that. But what I would suggest is that the focal point isn't the entire scene that we see here in this photo, um, because there's nowhere to kind of bring your eye to if that's the, if that's the case. So let me give you a few more minutes to draw it at this stage, and I've got a little bit more to read to you. Um, so I think really the secret, the secret to art, if, if there is one, <laughs> the secret to drawing is that it isn't a marathon and the prize is not 25 miles away and ever moving. I think that's one of the feelings that we tend to get when it comes to artwork, because we can improve and we can change the way we do things over a lifetime. Um, we can try different uh, materials, we can try different styles, we can, uh, you know, sometimes our art becomes more realistic or more abstract over time. But if we are always of that feeling that we will never get there, like there is never any closer because we had to keep practicing and practicing is this dull repetitive thing, it stops people from taking up the pencil or the paintbrush for just the joy of actually doing. And it's that doing that is the practicing that gets you to somewhere. <laughs> and so it's really important to sort of reframe that for yourself if you're running into that brick wall. So the prize, in other words, is in each and every drawing and painting that we do. Um, it's an exploration of depth and not distance. And that way, if we think our way through each drawing, even if it's going to be a relatively simple one, then we have learned something, even from the briefest sketch that we can take forward. If we're just mechanically putting in pencil miles without the thought, then yeah, that target is going to keep moving because we're never really improving because we haven't thought about what we're doing. And that's why in all of these classes, I've been trying to get you into a drawing by various different means so that you have some basis when you um, come across a subject matter that's similar in the future to go, wait a minute, I could try this drawing in this way, just like we did the dolmen or just like we did uh, you know, the houseboat or the robin or something like that. So more does not equal better if your brain is not employed in the process. <laughs> That's basically the, the message right there. So observation and practice definitely still leads to mastery, but thinking leads to art. And it's that next level. You know, the brain has to be employed. You had to be thinking about how you're doing this and, and not just sort of, you know, following steps, obviously, but also thinking about why we're doing them. I give you as much description as possible, but I know when you're actually doing this, it's, it's imprinting it in your brain and you'll have this information to pull back from later. Okay, let me move you on to the next step. Okay, so in this, this particular case, I was, uh, I was still on this idea of using um, uh, sketching, using line and mass uh, to, to add to the drawing, adding in the darks. Um, but you can see that I'm starting to sort of clean up and decide exactly uh, what is going to, you know, what's going to be sort of the feature at this point. So the little drawing in the bottom right has changed and you can see a little bit more definition here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of figuring out, okay, I, I probably need to accentuate perhaps some of that business of the woman leaning in from the left, uh, the woman le leaning in from the right, and perhaps the shape that is between the various women to give this sort of overall feeling. I do want to move on to the next slide, though, that 
just because. Uh, okay, so here we are again, uh, keep, keeping that little image at the bottom. So this is the point at which you um, squint again and look at where are the lights and the highlights. Um, I had added in some darks to sort of, you know, define around the head and that kind of thing. But now I've I've lost, I had lost my lights. I had lots of stuff smudged all over the place. So this is where I went back in with a with a with uh, an eraser and decided, okay, that piece of, of uh, paper she's holding up, I'd like the top of it to be light and the bottom of it to be a little bit darker. Um, I'd like to make sure that the, uh, you know, the scarf around the one woman's head, the arm that's being raised, uh, the shirt on the woman over on the left, the the pads of paper are all a little bit more defined. So it was it's difficult, I think, with this. You know, you start the more you look at it, the more you see. Like you start to see wrinkles in all of the clothing, and uh, you know, particular shapes here and there that you think should be important, um, and you're not quite sure. So you add them in to see, and sometimes you have to take them right back out again because they didn't quite work. Um, and in fact, there's a shape in here, which I'll show you at the end, which uh, next time I draw this will be taken out because it, it didn't actually contribute to the whole. So this is the sort of thing that just happens in a very uh, organic manner. As you're going through, you do have to go, OK, I put all those darks in. Now I have got to get those lights back somehow. When we're working with toned paper, this is the stage at which we, we um, you know, do some erasing and, and add it in with, with, you know, white charcoal, which is quite nice. On white paper, um, the white paper is actually that color. So I do see a lot of drawing that is done where people are using the white paper as a support. In other words, the thing that you're drawing on, but the actual white color isn't being employed effectively. In fact, everything is colored with some kind of value of some sort. Uh, and that really, to begin with, it sort of it sort of dulls down a drawing, I think. But it also misses the opportunity of, of just, hey, the paper color can do some work for you. It does different work for you than the toned paper, but it's there to be used. And sometimes covering it up with, with various different values doesn't make for a more effective drawing. You can always add something back in later. You can always darken something later. But it's really nice to have that very strong light and dark value structure worked in as you go. All right, so, so back to my notes while you're uh, doing some erasing here. So this idea of thinking and of the, the brain having to be employed as you draw, and, and not in a way that's uh, stressful, but in a way that you're going, okay, what do I think about? Should this be this? Should this be that? You know, question yourself as you go, you know, oh, I like that. I should do a little bit more of it. You know, that kind of engagement, that is what makes drawing so uh, kind of cathartic and uh, and sort of like a meditation because you become completely involved in this. Your, your, your mind, your senses, your visual senses, uh, sometimes your auditory senses, the tactile feel of pencil on paper, um, all of this, uh, your motor skills, you're, it's all working together in a really concerted manner. And I think that this is how you get into the flow of drawing. This is what makes drawing fun. So it is not, <laughs> you are probably way not in flow with me talking and you racing through these images. But I do hope that perhaps you come back and try th this whole set of uh, drawing again after the class, you know, watch the video, slow down, you know, pause as long as you need to, to get to the next stage. Because that is this idea of flow when we're all, when it's going from our brain to the hand, to the paper, and we're creating this, this art based on our own interpretation. You know, art happens when it goes through our head to our hand to the page like that, not just by moving the hand on the paper. That does not, you know, that doesn't do it. Now, after a while, and the more drawing you do, you'll be able to sort of get yourself into that, that stage that even if you're sketching someone like Edward Hopper did, where, you know, you're just sort of sitting in a cafe and drawing, your mind will automatically start looking for the right stuff. You know, it'll automatically start knowing what to, you know, what to draw, you know, what should it be concentrating on. To start off with, that's a little, you know, that's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. Um, and that's why 
I wanted to have you draw a group of people because that is such a complex image that the only way that we can approach it to start with is by boiling it down to this idea of the group. So what we're trying to do here is we're not trying to work towards more detail or more photorealism, but towards the expression of a scene or concept in a way that 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 strikes us in some manner, you know, that where we where we might be curious about what are they looking at when you look at this drawing, you know, well, what are they looking at? We we want to know what's on the other side of that page. That is how you create a drawing that is of interest. Not necessarily did you reproduce every detail in the photo exactly. And there are lots of ways to make this happen, of course. You know, this is one way to do it. Uh, you know, one sort of very, you know, I think approachable uh, way, but people can approach this subject, you know, in, in any manner. You can make this into an abstract if you wanted to. Uh, but I, I'd like to start with this idea of representation because I think it is something that obviously we're familiar with. And we, we know, we understand the emotion of what's going on here. You know, the curiosity, the one woman on the left looks like she's being a little judgy. <laughs> you just don't know, but it does create this sort of story. Okay, let me move us on to the next, the next stage so you get to the finish on this. Okay, so this is sort of where I ended up on this. Um, I actually had gone further than this and had to backtrack a little bit <laughs> because I had decided to add in the, um, the some of the wrought iron in the background. And then I decided, oh, no, you know, I need to take that, need to take that out. It wasn't working. Then I had to sort of fix what was going on in the background. So at this point, what I did was I came back in with some of the details I thought were needed. I added pencils into people's hands. Um, I, I, I put the sunglasses on the woman's head just because I wasn't sure was that going to work or not. And it wasn't the worst thing. I, it wasn't really a necessary um, item to add. And I also downplayed that little bit of her, uh, I don't know if it's a, it's a shawl or a scarf or something that she has wound around, the middle woman has wound around, wound around her waist and is hanging over the side of the, of the bench. I wasn't sure the way I had drawn it before. Um, really added anything. And I think if I were to draw the scene again, I would find some other way, perhaps eliminate it completely and just have that woman's body sort of have those edges be lost and go into the legs of the woman over on the left. So this is a sort of stuff that, you know, you don't really know until you get there. The, uh, you know, the, the changes I ended up making at the, at the, uh, the last minute, some of them I liked and some of them I didn't. Um, it's always interesting to sort of, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's kind of fun to take these pictures sort of in a time lapse to sort of see how things go. But one thing that I did kind of like was this idea that um, everyone is, there's a unity to the scene that stops you from worrying about whether people's legs are starting and stopping in this place or, or that place. And at the, at the end, what I did was I added in uh, some darks using like a 6B or 7B pencil just to sort of stop me from my uh, what would be natural for me which it would be to add, start to try to define you know there's a purse or a bag or something in between two of those women trying to you know define some of that because I didn't think that that would be any more useful than anything else and uh, then in terms of dealing with the background what I did was I smudged it and then came just back at, around the side with a kneaded rubber eraser just to sort of give you know some sort of form there so this idea of drawing groups of people. Um, it could be a group of kids playing. It could be people sitting in a cafe. It could be people on a park bench. It could be folks walking. Is really worth the time to practice because, you know, just as we don't have, you know, much in, I've, I did define the hands just a little bit because I thought that was important to the, the whole drawing thing, but the facial features really were not the story. The story is what's going on here on the bench. Um, and when you have only a short amount of time to draw in, I think this is a good way to approach drawing figures. You will always have an opportunity when you have more time to come back and draw a scene like that again at some point later and add in those facial features. You know, do it more carefully, add in the, the creases in the clothing and all of that sort of thing. But if you've got a sketch like this already and in the course of trying to make this sketch, you were keeping uh, your focus on the gesture and the idea of the group that when you come back to do something that's more detailed, you won't have lost that. That feeling won't have gone away. Um, you'll know sort of what you're focusing on. 
much more different than if you started in on a drawing and you started with the face of the woman on the left hand side and you kind of worked your way across. Um, any sort of feeling of life would really, you know, vanish at that point. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to uh, read some more stuff while you guys are finishing up your drawings. So this is really about what, what we're going to be doing for the next nine classes uh, or the next eight classes. <laughs> so um, we're going to continue to cover uh, techniques, but what I'll be stressing is different ways to approach each subject um, to try to steer you away from just uh, you know, either formulaic or sort of instinctive might be a better word, instinctive uh, responses to drawing subject matter um, that do have us, you know, looking at the details before, looking at the trees before we look at the forest. I really want to keep looking from a, a larger viewpoint at the scene and how one approaches it, because the, the, drawing the details is not the hard part. Um, getting the scene and the composition right is far more difficult. So this will be a, a kind of a, a framework um, for thinking about how you start. Uh, what, what drawing tools do you need to get there? Um, not how to draw people or how to draw buildings per se, but um, how to draw anything at all, depending on the physical constraints of your materials, like charcoal or graphite or whatever, uh, and the real life constraints of your scene. Is it very light? Is it dark? Is it detailed? Is it sparse? Is it cluttered? Uh, does it need editing? Um, while employing your own artistic take. And that artistic take just comes out. It comes out naturally as you're going through this. Um, you know, what do you like about the scene? Is it the emotion? Is it the atmosphere or the design? You know, the shadow and light shapes. All of that is, is what's going to sort of create your own style that if I were to line up, uh, you know, the pictures of everybody sketching today, they would all look so different because we had all thought different things were important, think different things were interesting. And in some cases, different things worked and other things didn't. That's just sort of part of it. But if you drew the dolmen last week and it looks somewhat recognizable, you have to, you already have the how to draw stuff part under control. You don't have to worry about that. The refinements then come over time and the artistic aspect will develop and you will think your way in through and out of a drawing, which is really what is needed to actually get to the point where, you know, you're, you're feeling a degree of success. So, you know, we don't have to separate line and mass. We can draw everything together at the same time, uh, draw them together as you go, not like a coloring book, um, you know, but like a, like a physical manifestation of the form. So in this particular case, we're looking at this group of people, you know, we're deciding at the end here, like, how do we finish that up? Do we finish it up by adding in more detail? I ended up finishing it up by adding in less detail. You know, I, I did, you know, define a few things, but I ended up kind of putting a lot more dark in and sort of pulling it all together. Uh, how you do that and, and whether you do it um, really depends on what your, how your sketch is going. You know, Edward Hopper went back to that scene over and over again to sort of figure out how he would want to do it. If I were going to do a larger drawing of this, I would go back and I would go through these steps again and maybe make some different decisions just to see what I liked best. Uh, you know, what I ended up with as a, as a final approach basically to, you know, to a, a larger drawing or a more detailed drawing would probably be a combination. And so this is uh, so important that the whole iterative idea of drawing, um, it's not extra work. It's just an exploration of depth um, so that you really do look at the drawing from a point of view of, of deciding what that story is, you know, what the atmosphere is, what's important, what the gesture is. Over time, that will become far more instinctive. It's really difficult to do in a 25, 30 minute, you know, um, period like this. It's, it's not, you know, I, <laughs> I was sorely tempted when I got to this step to go, oh, no, you know, how can I go backwards to what I was doing before? And I'm like, nope, this is this is how it goes. This is how it goes. Sometimes, you know, you, you push things too far. You have to restate them. I had to take out the wrought iron. I had to make a few other changes because of that. It, it is what it is. Um, 
And I think the process that you're going through to get to wherever you do, wherever your final um, stopping point is on the drawing, as long as you have ended up with a feeling of a group of people drawing that, uh, that you've achieved success and refining it from this point is just a matter of doing more drawings of this type, maybe more drawings of people sitting, maybe more drawings of groups, maybe more drawings of clothing, so that those details that you might have struggled with just become a lot more instinctive. Okay, let's wrap this up and move on to the next slide. So this is just sort of in a in a nutshell what we just went through. We did a no tan, we did a, a very rough kind of um, sort of line work showing the angles, that, how we were going to get started. And so if that was a sculpture, we would call that an armature. Um, basically the, the wire frame upon which everything else is sort of is placed. And so all of this business I've been stressing about angles and direction and proportion and shape and everything, that is the armature of a drawing or painting. If you can get that feeling right, then regardless of what happens along your path as you as you try to get to an, an end result, you've got that basic feeling there. If you don't fake it in, in, in the early stages, it's very difficult to get it back later. So I really do stress this business of that initial framework. Then you refine it a little bit more, a little bit more line work. What I tend to do if I weren't teaching a class is I would be working one, two, and three, those first three steps in together. Uh, I would be doing them automatically kind of all, all at once because adding in the darks, you don't want it to be a coloring book kind of concept. You want You really want to be when you get to the point of refining your line work, you can be already adding in your darks as you go and getting that um, squared away. Then you do a little bit of erasing, clean things up that need to be cleaned up, uh, do a little bit more refining, and then come into your end result with your darkest darks. So what I didn't do this week because I was working so small was I didn't add in charcoal. I felt that by the time I got to my darker pencils, I was already in enough trouble. <laughs> I didn't want to actually add to that by, by in the last couple of minutes, adding some more charcoal. But that is what I would try on the next go round. I'd be like, well, what if I made my darks even darker? What if, what if those darkest darks underneath the bench and on the, uh, underneath the drawing pads in particular really had more depth to them? What would I do then? In that case, I would probably not darken behind the heads, but I would have the stuff around the bodies a lot darker. All of these experiments are part of drawing practice. Uh, you know, you never really know where you're going to end up. <laughs> it's always going to be, you know, somewhere new, somewhere interesting and exciting, but it's not ever the same place. So there's never a reason to fear practice because it's a little scary, sure, but it's a, an adventure. It's travel. It's a journey, as they say. <laughs> and you can do it. You can you can do this. You can do as many drawings as possible and you'll only um, enjoy the journey even even more. So to wrap up for today, the concept. So idiom, popular quotes, shared cultural ideas can form the basis of your drawing. So today it was, uh, you know, home is where the art is, which of course is a takeoff on home is where the heart is. And sometimes a little fun phrase like that will give you an idea of what you want to draw. Um, what needs to go into the drawing? All the elements should contribute to the scene in one way, help the story and strengthen the design and not distract. Uh, it can be useful to assess how the drawing needs to work. For example, the angles of the, of the figures at the start so that the end result has some feeling of life. And when you're working on white paper, uh, just like with the tone paper, the paper becomes a color. So, you know, don't think that just because you're working on white paper that uh, all of a sudden it's got to be more difficult. You've got to add in more value. What you do instead is you is you remember that white is to be worked with. It's part of the light and dark uh, contrast. It, it Instead of on tone paper where we would have to draw the white in, in this particular case, the white paper does that work. So we just have to worry about the other stuff. And everything doesn't have to be co covered with marks and values. Um, there's no need to have everything be subtle light values if it would work just as well to have it white. Uh, and that decision can be made as you go, because if you leave things white to start with, you can always make them darker much more easily than you can back up. But luckily with graphite, we can erase. And then once again, um, 
vary the pencil strokes as much as you possibly can. You know, that'll come with time. I find I do it relatively instinctively now. I don't really make a lot of decisions about, am I following the form? Am I doing this, that, and the other? I tend to sort of hatch at will. <laughs> so if you find yourself doing that, you know, that's really great. What you just want to look out for is not having all of your pencil directions uh, being exactly the same. All right. Think about what you're drawing while you're drawing it. In this case, we're, we're thinking about the idea of group and not necessarily individuals. All right. Let me stop sharing. Well, once again, we have managed to get through one hour almost exactly. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, for doing that. That's not an easy subject at all. And you'll be so thrilled to hear that what we're going to be working on next week is a lot more calm and, and a lot more simple. We're going to have one particular uh, image that we're working with where we're, what we're going to be doing is figuring out what to do when all your values are light when there really aren't that many darks at all to work with. And we're gonna be working on how to keep your pencil in control so that your lights remain as light as you need them to in order to render a scene like that. So that's its own, you know, we've, we've done the very dark stuff. Now we're gonna concentrate on what happens when a scene has a lot of lights in, but it will be a lot less stressful, I promise you. We're gonna make sure that we alternate this. <laughs> okay, folks, until next week. <laughs>